just ordinary people to your ordinary people, Americans. I really appreciate. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and President Biden meet at the White House as Zelensky makes a high-stakes visit to Washington, D.C., his first known trip outside of his home country since the Russian invasion began 300 days ago. He's set to speak to Congress soon as lawmakers vote on whether to provide $45 billion in more emergency aid. Dozens of states are on alert for snow, cold, and wind as a major holiday storm is sweeping across the country. It's causing a travel nightmare with thousands of flight delays and cancellations today. The city's at risk for life-threatening cold. The first look at former President Trump's tax returns after a congressional committee voted to make some documents public. What preliminary details reveal about just how much income tax he paid from 2015 to 2020 and the year he didn't pay anything at all. After some back and forth in a Bahamas courtroom, former FTX CEO Sam Bankman-Fried has signed extradition papers, agreeing to return to the U.S. to face charges over the collapse of his now bankrupt crypto exchange. How soon he could face a federal judge in New York? Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We are tracking a major Christmas storm and the travel woes that come along with it. But we begin tonight with a monumental day in our nation's capital, 300 days after Russia invaded Ukraine. Tonight, the world is watching Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky as he's in Washington, D.C. on his first known trip outside of Ukraine since Russia's war there began. Zelensky is set to address a joint meeting of Congress in about 30 minutes after traveling to the U.S. under incredibly tight security. A few hours ago, the wartime leader met with President Biden at the White House. His message to Americans tonight, we will win. President Biden told Zelensky he and the Ukrainian people have inspired the world. Zelensky presented Biden with a medal from a captain on the front lines in Ukraine who wanted President Biden to have it. And a small bit of history, nearly 81 years ago to the day, December 26, 1941, wartime leader Winston Churchill addressed Congress under the shadow of the last major war in Europe, saying in part, here we are together facing a group of mighty foes who seek our ruin. Here we are together defending all that to free men is dead. Year. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, cognizant of the history we will see tonight, telling Zelensky her father was in the room as a member of Congress when Churchill gave that speech. Tonight, Pelosi said democracy itself is on the line. ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott leads us off. With a warm handshake, President Biden and the First Lady welcoming Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to the White House. Zelensky, a wartime leader now, in his signature military fatigues, Biden putting his arm around him as they walked into the White House. Well, Mr. President, it's good to have you back. Zelensky's historic visit, his first time leaving Ukraine since Russia's invasion 300 days ago. 300 days, hard to believe, 300 yeah. days. Been going through this and Putin's ways to brutal assault on the Ukraine's uh, right to exist as a nation and the attack on innocent Ukrainian people. Zelensky expressing deep gratitude. All my appreciations from my heart, from the hearts of Ukrainians, all Ukrainians, from our nation, strong nations, all the appreciations to you, first of all, Mr. President, for your big support and thanks from our just ordinary people to your ordinary people, Americans. I really appreciate. President Biden announced a new $1.85 billion aid package and that the U.S. will now send Ukraine the powerful Patriot missile defense system, something Zelensky has sought for months to protect against Russian missile and drone attacks. We understand in our bones that Ukraine's fight is part of something much bigger. The American people know that if we stand by in the face of such blatant attacks on liberty and democracy and the core principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity, the world would surely face worse consequences. Zelensky then speaking directly to the American people. My message, I wish you peace and I wish you to see your children alive and adults. And I wish you to see your children when they will go to universities and to see their children. And of course, to be t together with us, John Lee, because we really fight for our common victory against this tyranny. That is real life, and we will win. And I really want 
win together. Thanks so much. Not want, sorry, I'm sure. <laughs> President Biden with this pledge. But I want you to know, President Zelensky, I want you to know that all the people of Ukraine to know as well, the American people have been with you every step of the way, and we will stay with you. We will stay with you for as long as it takes. Biden pledging ongoing support from this country. Rachel Scott joins us now from the Capitol. Rachel, as President Zelensky prepares to address Congress and the American people tonight, what can we expect? Uh, what's he ideally looking to achieve? Well, we can expect him to make a very direct appeal for more military and humanitarian aid. Just moments ago, he arrived here on Capitol Hill, meeting with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Congress is considering sending an additional $45 billion in aid to Ukraine, but some Republicans are skeptical. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy warning against the U.S. sending a blank check to Ukraine. So tonight, Zelensky will make his case directly, not only to lawmakers, but also the American public, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott, our thanks to you as always. We'll hear from you more tonight. Let's bring in ABC's Terry Moran, our resident historian who's at the White House tonight. Uh, Terry, you were there for that joint press conference with President Biden and Zelensky this afternoon. And this visit does have some echoes of history when another wartime leader visited the U.S. Uh, give us a sense of the stakes of this trip. Yeah, it, it sure does have those echoes. They were so strong today. For a moment, it seemed, the White House was transformed. The daily grind of American politics faded away, and, and something larger and, and more awful emerged. It, you have to go back to 1941, right after Pearl Harbor, December, before Christmas, when Winston Churchill sailed the submarine-infested waters of the Atlantic to come here to the White House for weeks and forge the American Anglo Alliance and plan strategy with Franklin Roosevelt in World War II. And it had that quality here today. There was President Zelensky in the East Room of the White House in, in his khaki clothes, uh, right from the battlefields of Ukraine, and standing there and bringing that deeply personal message that he did, that he wished Americans peace, that we can see our children alive and grown up to be adults. Sitting there in that room, it was so unexpected, the emotion that he brought, that it really brought home the suffering and the terror that Ukrainian families have been enduring for 300 days now. And that, Lindsay, is what he wanted to do. He wanted to get Americans and people around the world once again to understand that this war matters in that way and that their fight is for us too. Lindsay? He certainly made it personal in that way. Terry Moran from the White House. Thanks so much, Terry. Former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, John Sullivan, joins us now. Ambassador, we thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Many people are comparing this moment to when British Prime Minister Winston Churchill addressed Congress shortly after the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. Put this in context for us. Is tonight a potentially history-making event? It certainly is, Lindsay. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very historic moment. Uh, the last time there was a war like we're seeing now on, uh, on the European continent was 77 years ago at the end, end of World War II. So the historical comparison is apt. Uh, and Zelensky's heroism so far this year in this war is reaching Churchillian proportions. I mean, he's really been a, uh, a resilient, bold leader who has, uh, has kept Ukraine in the war and pushed the Russians back. And of course, this is the first time that Zelensky has left Ukraine since the war started 300 days ago. Why is U.S. support particularly crucial right now? Well, several reasons, Lindsay. First, there's just the volume of the billions of dollars that the United States uh, has has given and spent uh, to defend or help Ukraine defend itself. But it's also the message that the United States as as the leader, uh, as a leader of uh, the uh, of in NATO and around the world, leading democracies and like minded countries and resisting this naked aggression that Russia launched, as you noted, 300 days ago. And the messaging that comes out of this visit is very, very important, not just for the U.S., not just for Ukraine, but for the globe, which is why uh, the Russian government is so sensitive to what's happening here. Well, what message does this send right now to Russian President Vladimir Putin? 
Well, Putin has been trying to send a message to us that he's all in. He's not going to stand down from the goals that he set uh, a long time ago for this so-called special military operation. Uh, and what President Biden has done today in inviting uh, President Zelensky into the White House, uh, sitting with him in the Oval Office, giving him as strong an embrace as an American president can, that's a pretty strong statement from the United States of our enduring support for Ukraine and its resistance to this war of aggression by Russia. You know, anecdotally, I've heard from some Americans who say, gosh, we've already given billions of dollars. You know, at what point, at, at what cost do we continue to give, even though they do support Ukraine? But how much can we afford to continue giving? What would your response be to the, the average American who is concerned that, that maybe we're giving too much? Well, two things. First, I'd say that there's there's definitely a conversation to be had about uh, the overall level of financial support that any one country, whether it's the United States or one of our other allies and partners, contributes to Ukraine's defense. So burden sharing among allies and partners is a legitimate topic, as is a discussion of whether any particular weapon system should be uh, given uh, or provided to Ukraine. But what we can't lose sight of, Lindsay, is who our adversary is, who the, 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 uh, the country that launched this aggressive war against Ukraine. The, Russia, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, who is supposed to be guaranteeing world peace, has plunged Europe into the first major war on the continent in 77 years. So we have to really keep our eye on the ball about how important it is that we, we assist Ukraine in defending itself. Because if Russia prevails here, uh, the consequences for the world and therefore for the United States will be grave. Ambassador, as you well know, today Putin announced substantial new investments in the military, including increasing the size of the country's armed forces and accelerating weapon development programs. Does this highly public state visit and the pledge to send Patriot missiles to Ukraine also risk further provoking Putin? Well, certainly, uh, I, I've, I've seen the statements that have come out of the Kremlin, including by uh, the defense minister, uh, Shoigu. Uh, look, Putin is all in. Putin is going to devote all he can, whatever resources he can, to, uh, to prevailing in this conflict. Uh, what's important for Americans to understand is that our security, the, the national security of the United States is, is significantly impacted by this conflict. Uh, it's not just European allies who are threatened. It threatens global peace. Whether he will go so far as to use uh, what the Russians call special weapons, uh, nuclear war, which he's threatened. Uh, you know, I think the current assessment is that's not likely, but nuclear blackmail is something that uh, the Russians have, uh, have used in the past. Former Ambassador John Sullivan, can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Thank you, Lindsay. My pleasure. Now to the major Christmas storm sweeping the country. 40 states are under alerts for snow, wind, and even blizzard conditions. The system will push its way into the Northeast by tomorrow night with dangerous cold coming right behind it. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it for us, but we begin with ABC's Alex Perez in Chicago. This is an absolute whiteout. Tonight, what the National Weather Service is calling a once-in-a-generation storm, unleashing chaos on millions of holiday travelers taking to the roads. Heavy squalls engulfing drivers on I-90 east of Rapid City, South Dakota. The storm leaving massive snow drifts and wrecked vehicles behind in Washington state. In Oregon, sheriffs confirming one person was killed in a multi-vehicle accident on an icy Interstate 84 overnight. And from Chicago's O'Hare to New York's LaGuardia, families packing airports. Airlines already canceling more than 800 flights tomorrow. Behind that snow and wind come the coldest temperatures in decades, stretching all the way to the deep south. In Texas, officials insist they are prepared to handle power outages. The, the power grid will, will remain up and running very robustly uh, during this uh, very cold snap. 
governor expressing some confidence in the power system there. Alex Perez joins us now. Alex, temperatures expected to plunge even further there? Yeah, Lindsay, here in Chicago, we are bracing for a sharp 36 degree temperature drop here tomorrow. It will feel like 30 below zero when it's that cold. Frostbite can begin to set in less than 10 minutes. Lindsay? All right, stay warm, Alex. Thanks so much. Let's get right to Rob Marciano, who's tracking this major storm and the brutal, life-threatening cold behind it. Hey, Rob. Hi, Lindsay. Boy, this thing's really starting to get cranking now. We had wind chills measured at 70 below zero in Montana this morning. And overnight tonight, I think temperatures in places like Denver will drop 50, 60 degrees in just a matter of hours. Here's a look at the uh, the map. Uh, it's, it's lit up like the proverbial Christmas tree with a lot of red there. Blizzard warnings are expanding, and we've got advisories from coast to coast with this massive storm that is now picking up some steam. All right, let's go over the, uh, the low and what we expect it to do here over the next 12 hours we'll start to see it intensify and then rapidly intensify as it approaches Chicago during the day tomorrow. Notice a push of uh, warm and wet conditions ahead of it across the I-95 corridor tomorrow afternoon. It'll be windy as well. And as this thing bombs out and rapidly intensifies, that's going to deepen the low and expand the wind field, which means that the, it's going to be windy across a huge swath of the Northeast and the Great Lakes and into parts of the Mid-Atlantic. And that will cause power outages. And even if it's not snowing in your area, when it does, where it does snow, we're only talking about maybe 6 to 12 inches, but it's going to be blowing for hours, if not days, on end in spots. And in the northeast and mid-Atlantic, where temperatures will be warm enough for mostly just rain, we'll see a flash freeze as the rain ends and the cold air moves in. All right, some of these startling numbers, minus 33 in Chicago for a wind chill come Friday morning. But Dallas, Houston, you're in the single digits. That's dangerous cold uh, for at least a power grid, if not for folks who are, are suspect. And then we we'll look for that cold to spread eastward across the entire East Coast, including Florida, come Saturday morning, minus 19 in Pittsburgh for Christmas Eve morning and Christmas Day, uh, Lindsay, does not get any warmer. So we're in here as we head towards the, uh, the new year. Doesn't look very warm, does it? We got the long haul of this Arctic polar plunge. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you as always. Utility crews are making some progress restoring power and water in Northern California after a deadly earthquake there. Nearly all power is restored. Fewer than 700 customers still remain in the dark. At least 80 aftershocks have been reported since the initial quake struck Humboldt County. The magnitude 6.4 earthquake caused widespread damage and launched a state of emergency. Two people died of medical emergencies. Tonight, after years of legal battles reaching all the way to the Supreme Court, Americans are getting their first look at former President Trump's tax returns. What we already know tonight is how much he paid in income tax from 2015 to 2020 and the one year that he didn't pay any income tax at all. Our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, reports. The most surprising thing we've learned from the release of Donald Trump's tax returns is that they weren't even being audited for the first two years of his presidency, despite a long-standing